listening to a segment from the Roll for Crit podcast, a podcast all about your favorite board games, card games, RPGs, really anything that goes on top of a table. If you'd like to hear more, you can, of course, listen to the episodes released weekly on Wednesdays, wherever you listen to podcasts. So we hope you're ready to hear what news we have in store for the week of February 28th, 2022. Hate to do it to you folks, but uh, we are going to a little bit have to remind you of the actual world at the top of this news roundup. Real world news that is happening. It is happening. very strange. Just you think board games would never collide with the real world. Yeah, but sometimes sometimes they do. In fact, a lot of times they do. When <laughs> certain things happen, you know, we've, we're living through a pandemic. That certainly had a plenty of effects on board games. And now, as you may have heard, there, there's a whole thing going on over with Russia and Ukraine. I'm not going to recap the actual news for you. I encourage you to go online watch tv read a newspaper however you get your news uh, and please also look at multiple sources as there is so much coming from many different places that might not be fully backed and that way you can make sure that you stay on top of everything and with the right information yeah just generally good advice uh but needless to say it is uh, now affecting uh some areas of the board game world uh namely a few different people are speaking out against russia for their actions invading ukraine and uh and saying that they are no longer going to do business with or in Russia, uh particularly Stonemeyer Games, publishers of games like Wingspan and Scythe has said that they stand with Ukraine. They have cut off, this is coming from Jamie Stegmeyer on the Stonemeyer Games blog, uh, they have cut off all economic ties with their Russian localization partners. Um, they, they, he says this will cost them somewhere between thirty and $65,000. Uh, he says they are forgiving any payments owed by Ukrainian partners, so any payments they had outstanding they don't need to worry about anymore. And uh, as of today, or as of the time of this recording, he's also donated uh, $10,830 uh, to emergency humanitarian aid for Ukraine, which is equivalent to profits that he would have received from a recent shipment of games to Russia. Uh, Bruno Cathala, the designer of games like Five Tribes and Cyclades and Seven Wonders Duel, also uh, made a statement on his Facebook page saying that he is asking publishers to stop selling his games in Russia and going forward, we'll, we'll do the same, presumably, you know, if until if and when the situation clears up, I, you know, I assume none of these statements are forever, but for the time being, and I would guess there are more of these types of statements coming if they haven't already that I just didn't see before we started recording. Uh, but it seems like I, I'm guessing this will cause somewhat of a wave, at least with a few other publishers. But uh, what, what do you think? You know, we don't usually see things like this on this. I think the last time I can think of that reminds me of the situation was uh, Black Lives Matter movement. When uh, protests started getting really big here uh, in the U.S., we saw a lot of board game publishers make statements of solidarity and donations and things like that. This is a pretty different kind of situation. Uh, and, you know, they're specifically... People are specifically saying we don't want to support the government of this one country. I don't know. Do you think that, do you think we will see more publishers talking about stuff like this? I this think so. I mean, just from my own general following of the, the news story, it, it does seem, I would say most countries seem pretty more on the side of Ukraine. So I assume any publisher in those countries will tend to lean with the countries. That's just my guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will want to point out one to for people to keep an eye out because I saw this is a game called Four Against Darkness. The designer is actually from Ukraine. Mm. Actually, I and, saw on um, not sorry to interrupt, but on uh, no, 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 please board game geek. They on one of their recent stories, they are lists. They have a whole list of Ukrainian designers. And there's and there's yeah. a lot more games than you would think that are like pretty popular games by designers from Ukraine. And I, I thought about it, I'm like, you know what? I mean, Euro games are, are, I mean, we think of Germany, but really all of Europe seems to be more. So it's not, it's like, uh, you know, it probably makes sense. Yeah. But this one I wanted to mention because the creator mentioned how he was lucky enough to be, I believe, away, but he pretty much lost everything. 
So if you're curious, it looks like a bit of a drawing maps dungeon crawl game to take a look, uh, see if you can get it. And I'm sure there are there's going to be more ways to try and help support not just him, but like the list that you mentioned. Yeah, a lot of the ones I'm seeing, like um, uh, Alexander Nev, uh, you know, I shouldn't try to say these names. I'll just say the designers of games like Mysterium, Spyfall, Dice Hospital, Detective Club, uh, Lock Up, a role player tale. Uh, Endless Winter, Paleo Americans. Some of these might actually be, yeah, some of these are the same designers, but uh, needless to say, there are uh, a, a, a lot of ways to support them out there. If that's your oh, for. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sorry, but the, the story I just heard, there's been an update, it looks like. Yeah, from whom? Uh, the the game, the, the Four Against Darkness. Oh, yeah. Thing. Mm-hmm. Apparently, he's looking like he's getting a, uh, he's trying to move the, files from his ukrainian computer to a cloud space so he can continue working in italy so mm-hmm. this game may not be dead yet which is great news well there you go that's that's encouraging but yeah i've seen you know uh, most of the responses i think have been positive to at least to uh stonemeyer and uh to bruno cathala's post there's definitely i've seen some people who i feel like stonemeyer games there are some people out there who just like you know, it's the internet. People like to post hate sometimes and (laughs) maybe accuse them of like, well, why aren't you doing, you're doing this thing to help people. What about these other people who need help? Why are you still doing business with this group of people? Or, oh, you're just doing this because it looks good on the internet and you just want points for that. And, you know, I, all of that, I think uh, is, I will be the first to admit there are, (laughs) well, yes. I, I, in the end, I, I think that's short version. It's bogus, but, Many actions that we take daily in general, you know, are, are way, they're not all just, I'm only doing it for this reason. I'm, yeah. I'm sure that's part of it, but like it, you can, you can tell when someone, when that's the main reason, like, look at me and thank me versus I don't feel comfortable about this anymore. Usually, uh, uh, taking a personal hit is a very obvious sign because mm-hmm. I think good, goodwill is good. And it's very important. I don't think it makes up the how much did uh, is is Stonemaier losing in deals? minimum thirty thousand dollars, right? You know that that's not which you know it's you know different size companies that might be peanuts, but I I think for Stonemaier that's it's not uh, at nothing. least I would say for most board game companies that's not yeah you know that's a pretty big deal for most board game companies. Uh, yeah, so it, yeah, it's, it's like yeah, keep an eye, but like understand like where they're coming from, and, and I think this is very obvious. Like also just the way. Like the Bruno Cathala one isn't just I'm not selling. It's he he has detailed steps explaining how it's going to work. You know, it's just understand that a lot of us are doing what we think we the best we can do in a situation like this. And yeah, we can't always help everyone. There's always problems, especially I mean, going with this whole story of like certain things that I don't think we should go into in a board game podcast. But it's, you know, this is an invasion. It's much easier when something is very sudden to want to do and make changes versus Mm -hmm. large structural, you know, going to, like you said, Black Lives Matter, which is not a a pinpoint moment, but more of many, many, many years. Boiling over. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the phrase um, perfect is the enemy of good comes to mind, you know, that it's you're never going to be perfect, but you shouldn't, that doesn't mean that you should criticize someone for trying to do something good. Uh, yeah. one so thing overall, I, we're, I yeah. think we're in support of these, by the yeah. way, if that was obvious. Yeah. One criticism I, I had also have seen a bunch of, which I do sympathize with a little bit is people saying, well, it's not fair to the average Russian citizen who yeah. does may or may not support this war, uh, this attack, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, um, you know that they they know they're being punished by this too and you know that's it's complicated that's that is it's it's a fair well, point it is complicated I, I hate to say it though in general and i mean i think anyone who's played enough strategy 4x games knows about sacrificing things and stuff right. when it comes to these such large moments i feel there is no way to go around this without regular people getting hurt like the sanctions are going to hurt the people the, like, for example, the sanctions are going to hurt the people in the U.S. just as like not just as much, but will hurt them as well. Like 
there's a good chance we're going to see major gas price increases and things like that. I, I just with the way governments are built, especially people in power do usually a pretty good job of insulating themselves. You almost have to get everyone angry at them by hurting everyone yeah. around them before you can get to them. I mean, and also, and you know, this is a, we're talking about board game companies here. This isn't like food supply or something. Like if the, if the trade-off is well to not support a, a government that's doing bad things that their citizens won't get to buy some board games for a while. I feel like as a company, you weigh that choice and you make that choice. Uh, but you know, every, every listening to this, you can, Oh man, that, 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 that just reminded me of a an, an really interesting article I read involving like the unintended consequences of like, because Russia and Ukraine are major grain exporters of mm. affecting other countries. But this is not the podcast for that. In <laughs> fact, I think we spent too much time on this. Uh, perhaps, perhaps. But it's a big subject. It's a big it subject. Is. It's it's everywhere. And I imagine that this won't, oh. like, like we said, this won't be the last time we make I do predict, by the way. <laughs> That in the coming years, future civilization games, or even expansions for ones that exist now, will have Ukrainians now as a faction. Mm, oh, God. I, yeah, I think that's going to come to play. And I bet, at least for Civ, uh, like the Civ games, which I know a little bit more about, that their special unit are going to be Jav- Javelin users. I don't know how this right say The rocket launchers. Because, mm. oh, boy, am I seeing a lot of things about Javelins. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff happening. There's a lot of terrible things going on in the world. Uh, go check it out for yourself, but that's, that's just the corner of it that is affecting board games. Uh, we will again, push you towards real news for the rest of the stuff that that's being covered. And now if you didn't already skip this section, we'll get back to just the board game stuff that you don't have to, uh, worry as much about. You will, will, for a moment, relax a little bit and return to the happy place that we try to cultivate on this podcast. Uh, we talked Go back to the news about dinosaurs. Just think that's about right. that. That's right. Pandasaurus, etc. cetera. Uh, but actually now we're going to talk about the Ador, the game of the year in France that we talked about a few weeks ago when they announced the nominees. Now we know the Ador winners. It's so weird to say it because it doesn't sound like I'm saying anything. <laughs> When you see it written out, it's got like an apostrophe. It's like, ah, Ador. I know that means game of the year, but it's just like four letters. It looks like nothing. Anyway, languages, what are you going to do? The winners for the French game of the year are, uh, for the uh, overall game of the year, it was given to Seven Wonders Architects. Uh, The children's game went to something called Bubble Stories. Uh, these insider awards sort of, I think that was their new one. That's sort of the intermediate category went to a game called living forest and Dune Imperium took home the expert category award. So I don't know how much that we have to say about these winners that we didn't already say when they were nominated. Cause I think, you know, the ones we don't know about, we still don't know about. And the ones that won, I feel like are the ones we kind of knew about and expected to win. Uh, but it does seem like, uh, you know, Seven Wonders Architects, again, strong showing. And I I am I'm mostly curious to see how this compares to the spiel uh, once that is announced by itself. It doesn't uh, mean quite as much to me. I'm glad. I mean, Dune Imperium, I'm glad uh, has won, I, I suppose. I, I, I have en- I enjoyed that game and it's clearly gotten a big following. And it's still it was also up against Lost Ruins of Arnak, which if I'm remembering in the united states did those come out in the same year or were those the year one after the other i think they were pretty close they were pretty close because it's just so funny that they're two deck building worker placement games that both happen to come out around the same time and are competing with each other but uh anyway i don't know any any additional thoughts from you about these winners um, I, I definitely still want to, I'm always feel bad that I feel like the insider and like child, I'm like, man, I want to try these, like at least talk about them. Well, but... there's a good, you know, they're not, we, we don't, I don't think we have them here in the U S uh, I could be right. wrong. Yeah. But so. I mean, I, even in general, I feel like that's always lacking Dune Imperium, obviously, and you know, nothing against the other ones, but love Dune Imperium. I think it's one of the, it's, it, and uh, Lost Arnak too, but personally Dune Imperium, if you want to make a deck builder should look to these games now a certain standard of like you can't just be a deck builder unless you're small and seven wonders architects um 
we played a little bit recently digitally, but it is a fun, lighter version that I, I definitely can get behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did we did play a little more of it on Board Game Arena, and you know, I think we both when we played it in person, it was like, yeah, it's Seven Wonders, but easier. You know, <laughs> there's not that much to it, uh, but it. It, 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 the fact that it goes so fast and you get kind of close to that same experience, there's something to be said for it. It's, it's, yeah. It's I mean, I mean, you, we've had this conversation. I'm almost certain when we actually talked about these, I still love seven wonders for being, I think a perfect drafting game. And that is a complex, I would say reasonably complex drafting game, mm -hmm. but this is a great one to have around. that I think is light enough to have fun and, to get back and, and, and weirdly enough, I think a perfect tutorial to just like get symbolism around. So when you play the other one, you're like, I know what a stone is. I know what, you know, I think my one issue with seven wonders architects and why I, I don't know what else it'll be up against, but assuming it's nominated for the spiel of the it, it just doesn't really do anything new. It really is just seven wonders, but like, you know, streamlined and, and faster. The that is fair, and it's something I totally get, but it's still something I think I don't that's the thing. I feel like it's 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 not just streamlined and faster because it's not really drafting. Right. I really just feel it's so much more I feel like Seven Wonders and both of them have the military campaign, which I really like because you look at your neighbors. But some reason to me, Seven Wonders Architects doesn't feel nearly as important. Like I don't feel like I'm thinking, oh right. Well, there's you just have there are far less fewer decisions to make. Yeah, that, I guess that's the thing because the drafting. There's so much more like, what's my bomb? What is this? What do you need? Like, what are my neighbors doing? Kind yeah. of deal. Yeah, and it's much simpler. But anyway, uh, that's the winner. So uh, still, still, I think a solid, a fun game. Uh, so that's that award. Now, there's a bunch of new game announcements this week, but the one that I feel like is the, to me, the I don't know, maybe possibly the one that will spark the most interesting discussion is Avalon Hill has announced a third edition of Betrayal at House on the Hill, uh, which is available for pre-order right now on the Hasbro Pulse website for $55.99 uh, to ship sometime in August. And Betrayal at House on the Hill is the semi-co-op until it's one person becomes a traitor haunted house scheme where you're building out this this spooky haunted house and then there's all different scenarios of what can happen you've probably played it before if you're listening to this it's a i feel like it's a pretty common beginner gateway game and uh the third edition is going to have of course some changes including new artwork uh up updated components the uh the clips for the character stats are i think actually going to fit onto the cardboard this time around <laughs> um and and there are going to be 50 new haunts the scenarios included uh they also said there's uh, a little bit more of a uh, a, ch a change as to how the trader is chosen in this version if if you're someone who maybe you're new to the game and you're not as familiar with it you can actually say there's like an in-game mechanism for you to decide you don't want to be the trader. It sounds like, so they're trying to make that a little bit friendlier as well as I think some new scenarios that kind of mix up the game, even from the beginning, not just once the haunt triggers, but looking at the components and everything that they've shown, it does look like, you know, the, the key, the main components, the card decks, the tiles, the dice, it looks very, very similar still. I, I don't think this is a departure in the way that, for instance, Arkham Horror 3rd Edition was from 2nd Edition. What, what what would your... I mean, what do you think about what they've said so far about 3rd Edition and what would you, you want them to do with a 3rd Edition? So, from from what I've looked about it, it, like, I feel... I love the idea of, like, maybe finding a way to bend the traitor a bit. Like, maybe not even, like... A more experienced, but you know, sometimes if like I've been the trader for the last three times we've played, can someone else beat? Like, mm -hmm. I know it's like I and I know that's sort of like well, that's just fixing the game. I'm like, yeah, but sometimes you just don't want to be that the one be all. And in a game think, like this, who, <laughs> why gripe over that? <laughs> I, I what I would like to see, obviously, because I think one of our biggest complaints is more balancing in the stories. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how you can do that. And maybe people don't want that, but I th I think it's possible. I'll say at least. 
I like this idea that they mentioned. Where is it? in the in the uh, article? But they mentioned like it'd be a game, yeah, a game system and different expansions. And like, all right, this is Betrayal at House on the Hill. Then we have Betrayal at Station in Space. That's like all space themed. Yeah, I think that could be a a fun way to tweak and mess around with it. I do like, in a way, like I looked at the characters and like now I'm just like okay. We're, we no longer have the super cheesy, I feel, like, ox who likes shiny things. It's going to be more modernized. I imagine people are going to have cell phones and stuff. <laughs> yeah, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, I, I want to I highlight what you said because I, I think that's an important element that I didn't mention, which is, yeah, they said they want to treat this more like a game system than a one-off mm-hmm. product. And and we should expect many different expansions down the line. Uh, that kind of I don't know that I like that. <laughs> that makes it sound like this is a like is this an LCG now or is there going to be no I I get monthly haunt packs like a game no, system I, I, maybe maybe I I guess the way when I read it Jonathan I read it more like I'm trying to think of a good and okay here's a terrible one because it's it means it's bad but Monopoly like you're not meant to mix them. You know, there's just the different themes. So kind of like what they did already with the Scooby-Doo and the Dungeons and Dragons one? A little bit, but maybe going more like not just we're tagging a property on there. Like we're really, like I said, all space one or uh, I I, I don't know, maybe one that's meant to take place in a city or post-apocalypse. But I think in order for this to be something worthwhile and at least succeed, I think, more amongst board gamers... Assuming if they, they could do your idea, in which case that, I mean, it sort of goes along with what I'm going to say, but let's say like they have the space theme, the post optics, there needs to be something that isn't just a reskin like the Scooby-Doo, maybe or D&D. Like it needs to be like in the space one, you are all going to have an oxygen meter or underwater. There's one, you know, like something that real, like each one needs to bring a new mechanic to the table. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, no, don't get me wrong. I love stories. I'm, I'm definitely a guy who can usually get into a game with most stories, but with Betrayal, considering this is not a new one, this is third edition, we have played plenty of Betrayal ourselves. I think to get a lot more of the people who may maybe have just put it down because they saw it as a a one and done or a one off, you got to make it worthwhile. Yeah, for my money, um, Betrayal Legacy is probably the best version of that game, and I still found it deeply flawed. <laughs> uh, I, from what I have seen of this, having not looked, they haven't released a rule book or anything, but it looks like they are not making it different enough for me. This looks like it's going to be basically the same game. Yes, I, I definitely think this one edition, I like the idea, but until we see it out, like, I don't know if, because it says in Queen of Haunts, like, what about the expansion? Is the Widow's Peak going to be just part of it? Well, it sounds I, it sounds like they're all new, all the haunts. I don't That's think what, I couldn't tell. It sounded like some of them were updated. Oh, I, some of them they said maybe would be like sequels to ones oh, from, no, it does say, from that or something. Yeah, 50, sorry, I misread it. One of the sequels to old favorites. But it's like. still like the cards look identical. The tiles look identical. The symbols and the tiles. Like the, my issue with Betrayal is the first half of the game. I'm actually going to be <laughs> honest, Jonathan. The tiles look cheaper. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't surprise me either. Like I this this I think needs uh, more than any other game almost needs the third edition the way Arkham Horde. Like it needs an actual new edition, not just a. Addition in terms of this is not the same game with same rules. It's a completely. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't in board games. We don't really have a distinction. Like sometimes a new edition means one. And well, sometimes I, yeah, other. I mean, <laughs> even in video games, there's that argument with the remake versus. But at least we no, have I, remaster I, and remake. Yes. Jonathan, <laughs> I agree with you. That's what I meant. Like with another edition, like if we go into space, I don't want just space stories. Yeah. You want well, I don't even that... need space. I want I just want the game. To I be mean, better I, in I'm a just using house. that. Yes, I just. <laughs> You know, the theme is not my issue. That's the one thing they get right in Betrayal. 
It's it's, it's interesting because I, I guess I sort of agree, but I enjoy the first half because that's just the ex- exploration. But do you still? But my problem is the way the first I enjoyed half, it ten years ago. I feel like a little bit, yeah, because I, I like seeing so some of these of rooms and stuff. But my but the problem 18th is eighteenth time you've read what what there's a hanging guy. Yeah, in that sometimes uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the bigger thing is it just never doesn't gel. Like I said, it, it has a hard time gelling with the second phase. Yeah. Because depending on how the first phase goes, it, well, I think it rarely feels like both are neck and neck. It I mean, it feels like there's a wash. Maybe my issues with the first half are come from the second half because it feels like the reason the first half is so boring to me is because I pretty much know that none of it matters once the hunt yeah, starts. Yeah, and, and that I agree with. And that's why I think the legacy does a little bit better too because then you're still like, I'm trying to get stickers and do all this stuff. So it, it, it uh, I, I definitely didn't think about that, but I agree. It would have been better for this to be an Arkham Horror, horror Third Edition kind of remake versus. It just I, looks I can't think like ninety percent the same. But I mean, the haunts could be very, very different, and the rules still mostly the same, and that could change the game a lot. No, that could, and I really so. do think that would be a huge difference because that transition does, at least for me, kill a lot of the fun because it is very swing it's so swingy that and i mean the fact that they made it so you can push someone push someone off from being the traitor is a good start yeah well, we'll but we'll, yeah. but that doesn't change it for like i said the people like us who have played the one and done or the one off yeah. as they say yeah uh so yeah yeah it remains to be seen how well those new things will work but it will be coming out this year in in time for halloween it sounds like so that's that's what matters uh now as i said there's a there's several other uh game announcements i'm just going to kind of run through them and see briefly or, or somewhat in depth i don't know no time limits but uh, what we think about them. First up, Level 99 announced they are making a Dead by Daylight board game based on the Dead by Daylight video game. That's going to be on Kickstarter. I don't think they have a date for it, but there is a page, a preview page for that up on Kickstarter already. You can sign up to be notified when it launches. Um, I truly know almost nothing about Dead by Daylight, but I found this interesting just because Level 99 doesn't usually do licensed stuff like this. So the fact At least that they not. Be- n- Usually it's anime related. <laughs> right. And it's like a little minor cameo or something. So the fact that they're drawn to this uh, is interesting. But uh, did, did you have any, do you know about Dead by Daylight at all? Or I mean, I've seen a little bit and a lot of the ideas that this, you can swap out different monsters who all have their unique play styles and abilities, which I think makes sense in a board game s- the scheme. I just don't know how, how this will work out on a, like, I can't tell if the board is actually just this colorful grid, which is a little sad, or because then the next pages are these beautiful shots with minis. Yeah, it's it's yeah the 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 one photo they show it looks very abstract kind of. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's it's level ninety nine, and I even even the games of theirs that I don't love, I still like. I don't know if they've ever really made a bad game. <laughs> like they really know what they're doing. I think. Yeah. It. it it's definitely got a good company behind it. And I'm curious to see how, I think the big thing will be how fun are the monster mechanics? Cause that's at least in the game. When I, what I little, I know I'm like, that's the fun part. Cause that's where you have all the weird abilities. Like this one bounces off, goes really fast and bounces off walls. This one can turn invisible. Yeah. yeah. You know, so um, will the humans have unique abilities too then? Or is everyone just going to have to fight over playing the monster? Yeah, good questions, good questions. All right, so that's Dead by Daylight. A couple of licensed ones here. There is a Disney Sorcerer's Arena, which is based off a mobile game. This is coming from the op, and it's going to be an expandable, like, tactics sort of miniature game. Uh, well, I don't think they're in the pictures. They're standees. I'm not really sure how it's going to work, but you'll have different Disney characters facing off against each other. And uh, Ravensburger also announced the wizard of Oz adventure book game, which is going to be the same system as their princess bride adventure book game, which we played and reviewed, but of course, based on the wizard of Oz following the events of that movie. 
Uh, I think it's probably safe to say for both of us, we are not excited about this Disney game. <laughs> it's based it's, on a mobile property. It's based on a mobile, and it's a mechanic that I'm not usually as big on. So, yeah, it doesn't the seem like Wizard of Oz one feels like a perfect fit to have next to Princess Bride. Yeah, I like, think that's a great choice. I, I enjoyed that system. The one I wanted was uh, Never Ending Story. I feel like I mean that, the... that seemed like the easy. Yeah, well, like, both well that and Princess Bride both literally have a book in it. Right. I mean, it's like, <laughs> why isn't that yet? But uh, that's a, is this the second one or second have one? Others? No, this wow, is only the been, second one. It's been, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been like a year or so. Yeah. So at least uh, I think so. I don't know. Time. Yeah. Time is weird. So there's that. Uh, next is Thorgol. Thorgol from Portal Games, which is going to be on GameFound. This is based on a Belgian comic about kind of about Norse mythology. I believe that he also goes to Atlantis at one point. I had never heard of it before this. And this is a cooperative game that uses kind of a, the follow action a system that we like, where one player makes a choice and everyone else gets a lesser version of it, but it's cooperative and there's different scenarios that are standalone. It's not a campaign you'll be playing through. Uh, you know, of course, I'm intrigued because it's Portal Games. Uh, it is not designed by uh, Ignacy Chevacek, but... I also have never heard of Thorgal, so I haven't. <laughs> but it just the general idea and theme sound cool to me, especially Portal Games, which usually does stories. And I'm gonna bet that one, at least one of the scenarios, Ignacy did. I, I just every time I see him, I just don't imagine like this designer could have come up with a thing, and he's just like, "Yes, I'm still." Gonna well, he's stuff. you know he's <laughs> you overseeing know? it all, right? It's... Right. No, but I meant like he can't help himself. Yeah, <laughs> like he wants to. And I like this because I could easily with a standalone just. I mean, like Robinson Crusoe 2 does it, which I like. You, like, it's very easy for them to be like, guess what? Download this new scenario. Mm -hmm. Free, like, uh, weird stuff. And like, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm, 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 I'm interested. Yeah, I am a little, I'm, I'm worried Portal is, they've been doing a lot of licensed stuff lately and, uh, you know, good for them that they're getting those deals and making that money, but I'm. It's just I hope it do, they don't go too far in that direction and start becoming Fair that. enough. I, I will say at the least, like this one, like you say, you don't even know it. So it's not like, oh, we're <laughs> just making Batman. That's true. It's uh, pretty And the Batman one, you know, it fits perfectly. It's yeah. the detective. It does. It does. And I have Dune. And, the, yeah. Uh, and like the, Dune at the very least. I feel like Dune is such a – it just seems to be such a board – like – this is a property that's already been loved by board gamers. Yeah, it's yes. true. It's true. It's it, definitely, it seems like things that they love and not things they're taking as a cash grab. So that's for sure. Uh, there is also announced a new cooperative version of Carcassonne called Fog Over Carcassonne, which has a spooky ghost theme. And you're doing your Carcassonne tiling gameplay, but you're also working together to try to keep too many ghosts out of the cemetery. And supposedly you'll also be able to integrate this stuff somehow with the other Carcassonne games. So it's kind of an expansion too. Uh, I don't have any interest in a cooperative version of Carcassonne. Actually, that's yeah. I, when I saw this one a little, uh, a little earlier in the week, I was like, this actually sounds pretty cool. Yeah. I, I I like this idea. And not only that, that I'm really curious of how it will integrate with the other ones. Cause that makes for a, a great way to have like, look, we're going to play this cooperative Carcassonne together. You'll get the idea of matching tiles. We can then play the competitive one, which is still, you know, it's still early on, but you now know the mechanics. You don't have to feel as bad if you're introducing someone who's never played a board game versus you, because I know that's always a big thing. And then mixing them together because if they enjoyed it. So it just seems like a final great addition. Not final, but <laughs> yeah, just more yeah, like right, finally final. that they made it cooperative. <laughs> I mean, final, like it's about time. <laughs> the final uh, start of 25 more expansions of Carcassonne before but the yeah, next edition. Yeah, I, I, I am much more positive on this than uh, I guess I usually am when it comes to Carcassonne. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it looks like it could be cute. Yeah, it's kind of neat. Uh, and then finally, this is not really like a new annou official announcement announcement, but I just wanted to talk about it. Uh, Cole Worley, the designer of Root, did an interview with Dicebreaker, talking about his next game, which we have learned, did learn about a little while ago called Arcs, which is um, going to be a sci-fi game. And I found it very interesting just reading from what, how he compares it to the game Oath and what style, the style of sort of ongoing gameplay that he's sort of taking from Oath, but which is also very different from the way that Oath does it. 
Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. But he, And then he also does mention that he wants his next game to be a murder mystery game. And he says that he doesn't think that in any current games, specifically naming Clue as a, a, an obvious one, do the murder mystery thing the way he would want to do it. And he wants to make it feel like a more uh, active, present sort of a feeling like you're trying, like, like going back to what an Agatha Christie murder mystery really reads like versus the way Clue plays out uh, is sort of the way that he described it. So for me that, I, you know, reading, he's made some of my favorite games and he wants to do a game of one of my favorite genres. That's like, yes, please give me that right now. Although also reading the way he was describing it, I did kind of say, I think uh detective uh, city of angels. It sounds a lot like the type of game he wants. I don't I wonder if he's played that. Uh, it's not quite a murder mystery in that Agatha Christie fashion, but it certainly. What has does that mean? Mysteries. I guess I'm. I'm sorry. I'm. I'm thinking I'm of an like, illiterate fool. But. <laughs> you know, like like Clue, like a closed room murder mystery, a uh, Knives Out. Okay. Death okay. on the Nile. You know that. I mean, yeah, I agree with you there about the LA one, but I will say also, I like I like the concept of Clue. You know, the find the. Yeah, the clues and like you have to like a deduction and then envelopes, but it has some major flaws. And I don't think it's one that's been flooded in the marketplace or, you know, overdone. So I'm really curious to see like what he would have to offer in there and like how especially I mean, maybe in this we can use this as our little bit segue with how arcs and oaths want to connect game to game. Like, will we see something of that in the murder game, which would be very interesting considering, in general, murder mysteries are more, I feel like there's a strong story presence, so. Yeah, it's and that's not, I mean, all of his games, they have a great theme in a way, but they're also, I wouldn't really call them thematic games. No, it's uh, it's not the, or the, it's not the, like, reading Arkham Horror where you're like, yeah, as the the slime drip. I feel like the like oath has oath theme almost comes from you writing it. Yeah, the themes are very. It's it's not about the narrative. It's it's about it's very much in the gameplay. So I'm really curious to see how he does that with that theme. I'm now imagining the cute animals of like root and oath, <laughs> just with <laughs> knives in their back. Yeah, know? it's gotta be. It's gotta be that art, right? You know, it's gonna be. Uh, but I, I and yes, yeah, going back to arcs, I do wonder if maybe you will uh, enjoy arcs because what it sounds like is whereas the idea behind oath is that you just play a campaign forever and the game keeps changing this it sounds like is going to be sort of that idea but contained within just like three game sessions and then you would start another new one after that so i i thought reading it maybe it would be more i mean we have no idea it's hard to say what the gameplay will really be like yet but maybe it would be more your speed as they're there would be like a finite end. So there's more of that like goal and meaning to your decisions that you see right away of winning that might or be, losing. I didn't actually read the article for this, so I can't comment. Well, I summed it up on for it. You. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's always, well, that's the thing, fun thing when it, when it comes to these things, it's actually going to be very minute, small things that can make or break. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think the gameplay itself is going to be very different, but it's just like that. Mm. Oh, that sort of, I'm, I, I, I mean, he it, it he even even if I know I might not like it, I'm gonna be like I still need to try it. Yeah, leader yeah. games always do study. Do us a favor, like this video, subscribe to our channel, or if you really like us, you can support us on Patreon. Become a high roller today for exclusive bonus content. We also have a podcast now. You can check that out at rollforcrit.com/podcast. Weekly episodes with special guests you definitely want to listen to.